Today, there are two million descendants of French Canadian immigrants living in New England. These are our stories. Welcome to the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. Venez tous jeunes fils et garçons, je vais vous raconter l'histoire de notre immigration ici au USA. De grands aventuriers de pays étrangers. This is the French Canadian Legacy Podcast. I am Jesse Martineau. And we have a little bit of a different kind of episode um, for the next couple of days. Uh, today was supposed to be a day that I was starting day two of my French immersion in Quebec City. Obviously, due to world circumstances, that is affecting just about everybody on the planet. That is not something I can do now. I understand that definitely bombing about it because I had looked forward to this trip for a long time, but it is absolutely not lost on me uh, that I am still incredibly fortunate because I have the ability to work from home uh, where I know a lot of others do not. So I still feel very, very lucky in the big picture for sure. And I do still hope uh, to find sometime later this year, next year, sometime to be able to go up and have that experience in Quebec City. That's the hope anyway. But because I am not up there making that trip, and because I am very, very far from the only one whose life has been really upended by this terrible virus, we decided at the podcast here that we we're going to come out with a special episode in which we contact a number of our former guests, a number of future guests, uh, just big names in the Franco-American community, and we had talk about what their life looks like now and what they're doing uh, to get through this time. I cannot say enough how grateful I am for the amount of people that came through with uh, willingness to participate. It was absolutely awesome. Can't thank them enough. So over the next three days, and we had, and we had to go three days because so many agreed to jump on with us, you are going to be hearing from a number of these people. And I think it's absolutely awesome that that many answered the call and agreed to participate. So we are super, super grateful. So the next three days, three consecutive days, we're going to go Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You will have a very special episode of the French Canadian Legacy. And again, thanks so much for those who helped us out. Joining us now is a future guest of the podcast and a name I know will be very familiar to the listeners of the French Canadian Legacy. Susan Poulin is a hilarious award-winning writer and performer. She's the author of two books and is a member of the Franco-American Hall of Fame. Susan, thank you for joining us. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, so what does your new uh, day-to-day look like? Um, my day-to-day is great. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, sheltering in place is an introvert's dream. Uh, I do spend some time worrying about my extroverted uh, friends, and I try to call them every now and then. But um, I've been so busy touring uh, along with doing my own work. I also work with an applied theater company based at the University of New Hampshire, and I travel all over the country doing trainings helping people have difficult conversations, you know, at colleges and universities and businesses. And we do a lot of work around bias, awareness and intervention. So the first two months of the year, I had five trips. Oh, wow. And I've been, I feel like I've been, plus doing my own stuff, I'm constantly memorizing and traveling and getting on a plane. So Yet when I'm home, my life looks pretty much like it does now. Um, My husband and I both have, I have an office at home and my husband is a mural artist and a public artist. And so he has a whole studio. So it's just the two of us and the dog. It it helps that he has a whole other building. (laughs) So we're not even on top of each other. I have, I've been catching up on things in my office and having time uh, time to do, like I uh, sent you the link to uh, a video blog for my character Ida, where she does a a dancing PSA, the (laughs) coronavirus shuffle. (laughs) So I'm getting a chance to do some things. Plus my first book, Finding Your Inner Moose, that I write as uh, my character Ida, is uh, they're getting ready to do a revised edition in celebration of 25 years of the character of Ida. Um, It's gonna have a new cover and I've written a new uh, author note. And uh, so I didn't even, I was kind of nervous about finding time to revise the book, but now I have time and it's great. 
So you're <laughs> not going to be bored at all during any of this. No, we're my husband and I were talking about this. We're just so used to be self self contained and to self propelled. We've both been self employed for a really long time. Uh, and we have no shortage of uh, things that we can do. And I'm also interested in what's going to come out of this time, right? Yeah, I did a keynote speech where I was talking about uh, something that Gordon, my husband, and I talk about a long time, a, a, a lot of the time, which is how restrictions spark creativity. My character, Ida, is a restrictive uh, writing choice that really sparks my creativity. And right now we're all in a restricted time. Sure. And it's amazing to see this splash of creativity on Facebook and for every sense of uh, every act of like hoarding and carelessness. Yeah. I think there are three, four, five, many more acts of kindness and generosity and and that is so inspiring to me. That is awesome. I love yeah. hearing this. Now, <laughs> one last question. I think this is an important one. What would you recommend? Do you have any tips for someone like myself who now finds himself stuck in his apartment for the foreseeable future? Ah, uh, I would say, what have you been putting off that you've been wanting to do for a long time? And even if you're working from home, you have your commute time that is now free, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And so I think it's about coming up with some sort of schedule that makes you feel like you're accomplishing something, but that you're also building in time to do things that you've put off. And one of the things I'm going to be doing this week, going into it, um, I don't know when this is going to air, is the Franco-American Center at the university is uh, having a bunch of Zoom uh, get togethers. So there are going to be these like kitchen table conversations on themes, different presentations, and to have time to do that and to participate is such a luxury. And I also opened up a free account on Zoom and I've been Zooming with friends. So I've been doing <laughs> Uh, like my sisters-in-law and I did a, a three-way Zoom call. I have a mastermind group, which is a group of women that we all have uh, businesses that are different, but we um, meet once a month to kind of give each other uh, uh, an appointment with Destiny for getting things done. We had a Zoom call with that. So in many ways, as a person who's very busy and outwardly focused, I feel more connected to my life and to the people in my life now than I have for a while. And I've been doing this thing where I made a list of people I haven't talked to for a long time. And I've been doing like a call, you know, if somebody, their, their, their name pops into my head, I go, I'm not going to text them. I'm going to call them. And I've been having these amazing hour long conversations with friends. I haven't had a chance to talk to for a really long time. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. I love this. This has been a really fun conversation. So thank <laughs> you for joining us. This is cool. Oh, thanks so much for asking me. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Our next guest first joined us back in episode seven. Abby Page is a writer and actor. She wrote and performed two amazing one-woman plays, The Fille de Croix and Peacework, when we were French. Abby, thank you again for joining us. I'm really happy to be with you. Where are you located now? I live in Fredericton, New Brunswick, so I'm about an hour from the uh, eastern border of Maine. And what and does that sound like right now? It's pretty quiet. <laughs> Um, we've been, yeah, we've been home for two weeks. I think it's a little bit more than two weeks now. My husband and my son and me, and, uh, the town is about, it's, it's probably about 50,000 people, including the, the student population at the University of New Brunswick, which is located here, but the, the university is closed now. So that's, that probably takes 10 or 20 people out of the mix, 10 or 20,000 people out of the mix. <laughs> no, I got you. Now, do your kids have to do school from home? Is that... The thing? Yeah, yeah. My son has been. Uh, his school has been closed for two weeks, so we have been doing stuff from home. Although we haven't been given anything. Oh, um, really? Parents in other places have been given work, but we haven't been given anything yet. So we're just sort of flying <laughs> by the seat of our pants. Yeah, you make your own homeschool <laughs> curriculum as we speak. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, I got you. <laughs> now, what has this done as far as your performance schedule? It's things you were supposed to do. 
Yeah, well, I had a show that was supposed to be opening um, about 10 days ago. Tonight actually would have been the closing night of that oh, wow. show. Um, it was not one of my solo performances. It was a play that was being produced by Theatre New Brunswick, which is a, a Anglophone theatre company here in New Brunswick, which was going to be a really great production. But it, it uh, was, it's was it been postponed, so we do plan to do it again at some point. But we were... Um, almost finished with our rehearsal process and then and then we just decided that it wasn't going to happen so it was disappointing but by the time it was called off it was sort of obvious that it was the only option so no i got you that makes sense and so what are you doing besides being homeschool teacher to pass this amazing time <laughs> Well, I mean, like everyone, I think I'm trying a little bit to like read the tea leaves or look in the crystal ball and, and look down the road and see what's going to happen to to summer and fall plans. Um, I was planning to do my show Les Filles du Quoi in, uh, in Montpelier, Vermont in August. That that plan is still in place, but sure. right now the border between Canada and the U.S. is closed and uh, who, you know, none of us <laughs> know what we're going to be doing in the summer. So right. sort of okay. waiting see what happens with that but so I so I am doing some work related to that show um in the meantime just on the off chance that we do end up being able to do it um and then I'm just doing um you know trying to stay busy doing um housework which which in some ways is like a a helpful uh ritual (laughs) you know (laughs) sure I'll get you out of here on this do you have any fun suggestions for someone like myself who now finds himself locked in his apartment for the foreseeable future. Ooh, let me think about that. Well, I suppose I should plug my own work and just there say you go. that you can, um, you can watch my show, Peace Work, When We Were French, on on Vimeo. It's streaming, and you can rent it or buy it there. Um, you can also just go and see the trailer and see if it interests you, but that's available to you any old time. I think listening to the French Canadian Legacy podcast is a, is a great <laughs> way to pass the time too. I appreciate that. <laughs> but yeah, in fact, I I just pulled it out. I do have your DVD, and I have watched it since being home. All right, but Thanks. thank you again for joining us, Abby. Stay safe. Yeah, you too. Stay healthy and take care of yourself. So our next guest is someone that will be joining us for an upcoming episode of the podcast. Ernie Hebert is a writer of a dozen novels and has a number of nonfiction works. He has been a columnist for the Boston Globe and is a professor emeritus of English at Dartmouth College. Ernie, welcome back to the podcast. Well, thank now, you. It's, uh, it's good to be here. Awesome. Now, if I recall from a previous chat, you live in a kind of a pretty small place and i'm just curious what things are looking like where you are because it may be different than what we're experiencing here in manchester well yeah well you know um my my wife and i spent uh, two months in uh, in uh, the southland and in uh and we left from tucson it drove uh, five days in the rain uh and i can remember we stopped at a at a uh, walmart a super walmart and uh <laughs> in the middle in the, uh, somewhere in in the, in the southland and uh, uh, I think it was Arkansas. Uh, and anyway, uh, no toilet paper and the people stocking up in cans and things. Uh, and in the same way, in Tucson itself, there was no there was no toilet paper. So anyway, I thought that was kind of funny that that people uh, would choose to uh, <laughs> to hoard <laughs> toilet paper. Who would have guessed that, right? So anyway, I, I live in West Milan, New Hampshire, and so in our household we have uh, th- four people right now. This myself, uh, my wife Medora. We've been married for 51 years, and uh, our housemate uh, Tom Washer, who's a uh, really good guy. He's all, almost like a member of the family now. Uh, and his daughter is here. She's uh, nine, uh, eight or nine. Uh, so those, the four of us are pretty much sequestered here. We only go out. Um, you know when we when we uh, when we need to. So what what are you doing that to kind of pass the time? Well, <laughs> oddly enough, uh, I, I'm not doing anything different. This is the way I, this is the way I live anyway. I, I'm uh, I'm working on a book, and uh, uh, so I'm I'm living. I'm I'm one of the few people who's living his normal life. I I hide out in my office and just work. <laughs> uh, I do that anyway. Uh, the only difference is that. Uh, you know, I've got friends once in a while we get together, and, and uh, we don't get together anymore. Um, my life is relatively easy because it's it's the same life that I normally live. But uh, my my housemate, you know, he's he's got a job, 
Uh, and right. uh, he has not been laid off. Uh, he's a broker for uh, organic grocery stores. So he and his company doing everything online right now. They don't know how long this is going to continue. I mean, how long they can, they can continue doing that. But that's their situation. And my wife, Medora, she's a very social person, and she's a self-imprisoned hinge. And she's the one who's kind of uh, taken over you know the the duties we have to perform to uh, to isolate ourselves. Uh, we uh, you know we we sanitize everything and and, and she, she's she's the uh, she's the school mom so to speak. <laughs> now, do you have any tips for those like myself who are now stuck inside for the foreseeable future? Uh, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're, we're stuck inside in one sense, but we do go out for ne- necessary things like grocery store. Awesome. All right. Thank you for doing this, sir. Appreciate it, sir. You're welcome. Joining us now is a guest that we will actually feature on a future episode of the podcast. Our Jean Mathieu is an author of all kinds of genres, including a really super interesting science fiction piece called Glass House. And Arjun, thank you very much for joining us here hey, on this special episode of the podcast. Hey, bonjour. Uh, merci for having me. <laughs> now, for our listeners, where are you located right now? I'm located in presently somewhat overcast San Luis Obispo, California, formerly known as the happiest place in America. <laughs> um, it's been an interesting trip out here on the on the left coast i gotta tell you yeah so what what is life like in california i know you guys got hit pretty hard pretty early from what i understand two weeks ago i I work night shifts sundays through thursdays so at two o'clock i showed up at work on two sundays ago after meeting and uh i saw that it was halfway depopulated and there was a bunch of uh information that had happened over the weekend that I knew nothing about, Um, and we were given the stark choice, do we want to work from home or from the office? So, you know, called the wife, talked it over, decided I would be working from the office, which is why on Wednesday I was packing up my computer to uh, uh, try and work Thursday from home. Everything moved that quickly. Yeah. And then last week I had to move again because I live in a uh, townhouse apartment built out of the barn on a working horse ranch. Um, (laughs) Oh, And as it turns out, spotty internet and uh, the sound of horses neighing and kicking against metal grates is not considered terribly professional environment for, gotcha. you know, working tech support online. That's definitely tough. What What do you do now? I mean, are you still full-time home? What What are you doing now? Because I'm assuming you guys can't, can't leave the house for anything, like, besides, you know, go to the grocery store. It's slightly more permeable than that. Uh, my wife's family has most graciously allowed me to set up my office at their place, which is a little more sedate. She and I have to visit every day to help care for some of my in-laws. So oh, wow. it's not like we weren't making that trip anyway. Sure. I got you. Okay, well, I'll leave you on this. This is a super important question. What would you suggest for people like myself who are now stuck inside an apartment for the foreseeable future. Do you have any tips, hints, to get through this period? About two months ago, I actually took a French test at work to see about working the French phone lines and helping no cousin uh, north of the border, and I failed it. My French is not good enough. It's not, you know, up to snuff to work in a professional environment, and that was a a bit of an ego hit, i got to admit. But uh, La Survivance exists for a reason. And for those listeners who are unfamiliar, La Survivance was originally this concept of, okay, we're going to hunker down, we're going to stay Catholic, we're going to stay French, and good King Louis is going to be coming back for us any day now. And sort of evolved into this stubborn refusal to be anything less than French-Canadian, which, as you, you know, may have noticed, has had some impact on Quebecois culture and politics over the years. Sure. Um, and lost survivants exists for a reason. It's not enough. It's not enough just to make it through this. It's to make it through this as ourselves and actually 
reconnecting with my French roots, reconnecting, even though I'm a Quaker, reconnecting with my family's Catholic history and reconnecting with, you know, a relationship to the soil. I, my first instinct once uh, the order came down to stay in place was to start a garden inside has actually helped keep me coherent and helped keep me sane during this time. In addition to, I'm going to absolutely rock that French test next time I take it. <laughs> I like that. That's a really good idea. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for your time, man. <laughs> Thank you. You have a great day. You too. Now, our next guest is someone we spoke with in episode 25 of the podcast. Suzanne DeRoches is a writer in the super interesting novel, Bride of New France. Suzanne, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Now, for where that. are you located now? I live in Toronto, in Ontario. Okay, now we're here in that, ep- that area of the world got hit particularly tough by this virus. What does life look like for you guys? Yeah, I think um, all big cities, I guess we were expecting it because we know we're, we're a hub of people sort of in and out from all over the world. So sure. we, we got hit early. We knew we would. Um, I think we, we're, we're doing okay. I mean, all things considered, um, our governments have sort of given us advice on what to do to try to keep safe, which is mainly stay indoors and sure. uh, only go out when you absolutely have to. Uh, most uh, businesses have been closed. Um, just essential services remain open. So for us, that's pretty much the grocery store and, uh, and right. home. So yeah. So what does your new normal look like? What are you doing day by day now? Yeah, so for us, it started two weeks ago. Uh, Yeah, March 13th was when um, we were recommended to do this thing called uh, self-isolation, which is basically to stay with just the members of your household and to not interact with other friends or family. I don't know if it's the same for you guys. Yeah, I mean, well, it's very, very state by state as to how much that's enforced and or recommended. Yeah. 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 So here um, it has been, I mean, it did come down from our prime minister and uh, I mean, his wife got COVID. So I think that's sort of right right at the time that uh, he was making the announcement to kind of shut things down. So I think that added a kind of (laughs) gravitas to the situation. And uh, for the most part, people are adhering to it. Again, same thing, region to region, there's some variance and some people who maybe think they're safer in certain places. So are doing things that they probably shouldn't and putting themselves at risk but um here in toronto yeah i think people get the idea and uh are mostly staying indoors other than you know there's still a lot of services are essential so there is still a lot of things that are going on and a lot of people you know obviously medical professionals but you know people working in construction other places um transit you know and and these people are catching it so now, I know you have kids, and one of the things that's happening in various states, not all, in various school districts here, is that all of a sudden the schools, all the way down to like first grade, have turned into, uh, we're going to be a virtual school. And they had about 48 hours to pull this off. Is that kind of the same deal that's happening in your area? Yeah. So when, um, I don't know, if, I think in the U.S. the March break is the same for the most part, right? I don't know. We had a March break. The first week was a holiday week anyway. Yeah. Of course, everyone psychologically kind of went into panic mode, so it didn't really feel like a holiday and we were all stuck at home and stuff. But theoretically, there was no school that week. So that gave the school boards a little time to prepare. But so far um, in our province, all that's been um, given out is a kind of list of websites. And I'm actually a teacher as well. So our directives have simply been to um, point parents to those websites, basically some online learning tools, but the parents themselves will be the ones directing it for now. That's kind of phase one. And then phase two, presumably the teachers will be more involved in trying to give kind of direct specific learning to the kids. But for young children, I mean, it's very hard to do that without having a parent standing behind them and guiding them through it. So the idea that schools can care for your children while you work, that sort of thing, I think is kind of out the window for the foreseeable future, which has a lot of people panicking, but 
All right, so I'll get you out of here on this. What suggestion do you have for someone like myself who is now stuck in an apartment for the foreseeable future? My the issue I'm having is, believe it, I work in, I live in what used to be mill housing. Yeah. So uh, I've been there's like four floors, three apartments on each floor, and a, one staircase that empties out directly in front of my door. So because I'm on the first floor. So I'm there's pretty good traffic about going back and forth from immediately outside my place. So I've been uh, pretty tight making sure I stayed in yeah. the house all the time. Yeah, I mean, I guess for me, if I, you know, specifically if I were sure. in this yeah. I would probably just once a day cover my face with a scarf to get out the door, get the fresh air and come back just for kind of mental and physical yeah, just stay sane. I mean, I don't know. At some point, are there going to be sort of police officers the way there are in Italy that are sort of telling you you can't leave? I have a friend in France. You know, she told me it's the same situation. You need a special permit to leave the house. And I don't know. I don't think in North America, frankly, that we're organized enough to be able yeah, to that'd be tall, that sure. sort of presence. But who knows? All right. I, all yeah. right. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Good luck to you. No problem. To Good luck. Thank Take you. Care. Appreciate it. Bye. So joining us now is a name that will be quite familiar to a lot of the listeners of this podcast. Paul Pere. He had a career as a newspaper reporter. He's an Emmy winning TV producer. And he is the writer of the book Roadkill, as well as Singing the Vernacular, which was one of our Christmas suggestions. So, Paul, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you. Now, where are you located now? I, I'm living in the Gunquit, Maine. Been here for about, oh, 20 years at least. And what does a Gunquit, Maine look like now? <laughs> well, it looks like winter, but um, <laughs> it, it's quiet. It's very, um, they've closed most of the main beaches in southern, it's right on the ocean, okay? But most of the main beaches... Uh, in southern Maine, from Wells to Agana to Kittery, including Agunquit and York, they closed off the beaches from the public. Uh, there are, you know, the passing lots are, are roped off. There's nobody around. There's nobody around. You take a walk on the street and you won't see a soul. Gotcha. So how are you passing this time then? Do you have any suggestions for the rest of us? Well, I'm writing. Not as much as I should or want to, but I am. I've got a new book on the on in the works titled "Outside the Box," so I've been writing on that. I just did a poem. I did a poem in French, actually, and it's going to be published in this uh, June issue of uh, the Forum at the University of Maine. So I'm, I'm, I've been I've been retired. I'm 75. Okay, so I've been retired. <laughs> And I've been writing, and more often now I'm doing, uh, I'm trying to do things to keep my mind alert, to stave off uh, any uh, senility symptoms. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, well, don't laugh, you know (laughs) what I, so think you're I, doing do, uh, I do a lot of puzzles. I do crossword puzzles on online. I do the New York Times crossword puzzles. I do these quizzes, uh, mostly trivia kinds of things. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I'm at the computer all day, practically. Gotcha. Now, do you have any suggestions for any of us who are now all of a sudden finding ourselves inside all the time? Huh, good question. Um, I mean, everybody's got a different different outlook. My my escape is definitely the uh, the computer. I, I read online. I read about four or five newspapers a day, uh, including the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the local papers, here. even the Union Leader, which I, when I was working in Manchester, we used to call the onion the onion peeler, but. Um, <laughs> So I read the newspapers. I there's some. Uh, I'm on Facebook, uh, chat with people. So I mean, I my circle of contacts and friends, thanks to social networking, is much greater than it ever was. So 
I, I say, I mean, my advice is social networking. What else, you know? There you go. Good I, mean, I, can, Thank I, you very I can go downtown here and I can see one person. I'm on, yeah. I'm on the internet here and I can talk to about 20 people. And more, you know, almost all at once if I had to, wanted to. Uh, that's, that's my advice. Idea. I'm joking with a bunch of buddies and then we're going to form a, um, a club called the Sons of Senility. It's <laughs> awesome. So, it's keeping you busy. Me- we're going to have meetings when nobody's going to show up because we forgot. <laughs> That's terrific. All right, well, thank you very much for joining us, Paul. Our next guest, Alexandra Chartrand, is an award-winning film director, editor, and producer. And I've seen some of his documentary work, and it is outstanding, really, really compelling stuff. So, Alexandra, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. So where are you currently located, and what does life look for you now? Look like for you now? Well, I'm uh, I'm located in uh, in Montreal, originally from Ottawa, uh, Franco Ontarian, for uh, born and raised, and I I moved to Montreal to uh, to study at uh, university, and now I, I I live and work here. I have some kids, and I'm based. Uh, and right now it's pretty it's pretty calm. It's pretty uh, <laughs> yeah inside the uh, life uh, with my- <laughs> <laughs> gotcha hanging out now has this impacted your filming schedule at all well for sure because the every, the uh, every shooting have been canceled so there's nothing basically going on there's a bit of editing um, I'm, I'm doing some some studio work for for uh for a company uh, who hires me right now, so I, I still have a, a bit of work to do, but not much, and uh, pretty much uh, waiting for for things to clear out in order to to be able to come out and and be able to start over with some shooting. Yeah, yeah. for sure. So, what are you gonna do with your time then? The time <laughs> that you wouldn't spend shooting now that you're stuck in the house. Yeah, well, I I thought I would be reading a lot, <laughs> <laughs> and. I haven't watched that much film either because I, I I have, yeah, I have two two uh, small boys when they're oh, quite shit. young, and uh, I'm I'm more of a daycare uh, <laughs> <laughs> father. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm playing with them because my my girlfriend uh, their mother is uh, she she has plenty of work to do and she she works from home as well presently, so I have to keep them uh, busy in order for her to work. So. I'm kind of the uh, the geo uh, in our house right now. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, what would you suggest to someone like myself who is now stuck in the apartment for the foreseeable future? Yeah. Well, if I had a, a chance, I'd be catching up with a, a, a bit of documentary films. I'm, I'm a documentary filmmaker. It's, it's, sure. a bit, it's kind of a, a virus as well because when you're hit, you, you can't... Uh... <laughs> I like that. You can give it up. You have to to uh, watch documentary film and stuff. So, uh, there's plenty of of, uh, of films out there. There's a lot of stuff to watch, and and there's plenty of of companies as well who have opened up their their collection, and it's uh, available for free right now online. So there's so much stuff to to look at that I, I would love to have a bit more time in order to catch up on on stuff I haven't had the chance to to see. If you're interested, I, I I'm not sure if the because uh, one of the company for whom I, I work, um, they're a film distributor, uh, some independent film which are shot and made here in Montreal, who have opened up their entire collection. It's available online, and I I'm not sure if it's geolocated, so I'm not sure if from the United States if it's accessible. Gotcha. But F3M, F3M, the the pretty much all their catalog is available in in English versions uh, with subtitles or and and I know that their 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 entire catalog is open and free right now. So F3M.ca, uh, that's it. They have uh, well some some very good stuff there. Yeah. No, that's awesome. And I'll note that some of your stuff is available. Yeah. Well. <laughs> My 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 previous film my, my have two films that are online right now. Uh, the, what, I, I've been focusing on what's going on in Catalonia. I'm I'm 
Not too sure if uh, on your side of the border, if you're aware of what's going on. But Catalonia is, is a region in Spain and people from Quebec feel like pretty much uh, kind of a cousin like relation because we feel that we, we have the same kind of relation with the central state or Quebec. Quebec, we speak French, where the rest of Canada speak English, and we have the, the power is centered around Ottawa. And in in Spain, the, the main language is obviously Spanish, uh, but in in Catalonia, which is have uh, their capital is Barcelona, they speak Catalan, and they they feel like they're alienated a bit from from Madrid. So I've been following up on what they're doing in the last decade or so, <laughs> been yeah. shooting a few films out there. And I, I speak a good Catalan, so I can get my my way around there. And I, I shot two films uh, with these fantastic people who were uh, asking for for decentralized power from from Madrid in order to to do their business and have schools in Catalan and stuff like that. So they're kind of fighting for that right now. And I, my two previous films are about that. So one is called Forbidden People. It, it's uh, it came out in 2016. This one is free. Uh, it's online there. The entire film is there for free on on my Vimeo platform. So Forbidden People, the English uh, subtitle version. And uh, my latest is called uh, End with a Smile, the Revolution, where they, they organized a referendum in 2017. And I was there to, to shoot and Uh, it was an illegal referendum, so the, the Spanish state uh, sent the police and they, they harshly uh, intervened in the, in the voting, uh, beating up some, some elderly folks and stuff like that. It was kind of a uh, frustrating thing to, to be shooting because they, they were acting like a bun bunch of thugs uh, with these people who were trying to put a, a ballot in, in a ballot box. <laughs> so. Right. Yeah, you what know, kind of a weird situation, but anyways, it, it's the subject of my 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 latest film, which is available. Uh, this one is is for rent because it, the the distributor uh, is still trying to make a bit of money. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> And I will note, I have seen. I didn't know anything about Catalonia at all. Very very little anyway. Uh, saw the work that you had done. The obvious parallels are there between what stories we've heard coming out of Quebec. So that makes a ton of sense. And they're absolutely awesome. Please check them out. Thank you so much for joining Thanks us, for sir. Having me. Thanks. Thank you. Joining us now is Will McGrew. Now, Will was the guest for our episode 27 of the podcast. Will is the founder and CEO of the incredible organization Tele Louisiana. Will, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much. Happy to be back. Now, I'm sure I'm not getting the full picture up here in New England, but what we are told is that things are not going incredibly well down where you are. So... <laughs> Maybe you can give a, an update. First of all, let everybody know where you are and kind of how things are going down there for you guys. Yeah, for sure. So, um, so I'm here in I'm here in New Orleans, and we have a pretty bad outbreak here. The good news is that we were pretty like our governor and our and mayor implemented like shutdown orders pretty quickly, um, and so we've been operating kind of like on stay at home orders uh, with not only not only essential businesses functioning. Sure. Um, for, for, for longer than most of the country, around the same time as California. But the bad news is that basically this, so the two, two things. One, um, in February, we had Mardi Gras, of course. Sure. Um, and what, people, what many people don't understand is that um, Mardi Gras is, of course, a day. It means Fat Tuesday, but it's also like a season, carnival season. And so throughout that time, there were, um, you know, from January, January 6th, more or less, all the way through February, I forgot what day it was. I think it was February 24th or 25th this year, especially in the two weeks leading up to February 25th, there were parades and celebrations and all sorts of public gatherings that obviously yeah. contributed to the spread of the disease. But so that's that unfortunate. But then the other kind of negative part of it for us um, is that in April is when our festival season really takes off. Um, we go from Mardi Gras to festival season, and that's a big economic driver for us. Um, and so that's another thing that we're being hit hard on. The, we have a particularly grave situation because of Mardi Gras, a lot of people think, and also other kind of New Orleans is a hub for um, international and national uh, travel. Our leaders have been somewhat proactive, and the population has responded pretty well. So I think we're doing the best we can given given the circumstances. 
What I think is crazy is we spoke the week of Mardi Gras, and That's- not that long ago, and we just never came up. I mean, how, how different is the world in a matter of weeks at this point? I think it's nuts. It is. It is, really. Now, what consequences has all this had for Tele Louisiane? So, basically, it's kind of put a lot of our projects on hold, obviously, because most of we, we create media in French, also in Creole, in Louisiana. And so, everything that involves, like, anything external um, is on hold. So, you know, we had a few interviews planned. Few, a few other productions for local companies. Um, also, we were working on um, some like legislative changes with the state um, around French in Louisiana, specifically around uh, media, uh, French media in Louisiana. Um, and so all of that is on hold, um, which is just kind of like the nature of the, the situation sure. we're in. Both at Telelu and otherwise, we've um, and otherwise in like the francophone community in Louisiana, people have been really innovative in trying to find um, online ways to continue to speak, you know, uh, practice the language and the culture. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, like uh, virtual Zoom, virtual French tables, et cetera. French tables are really big in South Louisiana, um, and so a lot of them have transitioned online. We've done one or two as well. Um, so yeah, that's basically um, that's basically where we're at. And kind of just waiting out to see when we'll be able to start um, planning planning again. Sure. Now, do you have any fun and exciting tips for someone like myself, who is probably going to be locked in the apartment for the foreseeable future? Oh, really? Oh, fun and exciting tips. I don't really know. I mean, we do. So, I mean, the good news is that our our views have definitely like gone up a lot um, <laughs> on a lot of our like documentaries and stuff because sure. I think. Obviously, people are, are home, so definitely check out a lot of our um, videos on on our YouTube page, especially. the The nice thing is that we have a pretty wide range from like documentaries to short films. A few, what one or two is nonfiction, one or two is our fiction. Um, we have this really um, interesting animated clip that we just put out about five minutes that describes what is Louisiana French in Louisiana French. Uh, a, nice. a, a famous poet or a, a locally famous poet is the narrator. Yeah, and there's a, there's a few other interviews and things like that. So definitely check out our, our page. And then otherwise, it's a little bit difficult because I would suggest eating some Louisiana food. That is, the <laughs> is that our restaurants our restaurants are still open, many of them, not all of them, but for takeout. So here we've been trying to, I know a lot of the people as part of the team have been trying to order more um, takeout than usual in order to like support local businesses. I like that. This is tremendous ideas. Thank you very much, Will. Appreciate it, sir. Thank you. All right, Tanya Chevenel is a name that will be familiar to our listeners. She joined us initially with their dad, Ray, back in episode 13. And she was also nice enough to conduct the interview of Mike and I, along with my sister, Monique, which we included for our one-year anniversary special show. Tanya is an incredibly talented filmmaker behind the amazing documentary, The Home Road. And she is the author of a really fun children's book, The Main Birthday Book. Tanya, thank you for jumping on with us again. Thanks, you guys. Yeah, so what does your new reality look like? Well, um, I just watched the Cubs win the World Series. So So you got a lot of time at home? Is that what you're telling me? I'm telling you, you know, usually on a weekend, I mean, there's usually some sports television in my life. So then, you know, naturally I turn it on. And so I just get to watch the Cubs win the World Series again in 2016. So So what is this done for you and this whole book promotion that you are involved in now, do you have any events that were kind of jacked up? Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually did do two book signings on the weekend of March 14th and 15th. And then, you know, here where I live, that was really the end. And in fact, interestingly enough, the governor of Maine was at the book signing I did on Saturday, the 14th, you know, and that was one of the last days that people, could go out and support local businesses. She wasn't there for my book specifically. <laughs> we make that clear, clear that up. But she said she had bought the book the week before in her hometown of Farmington, so that was nice. Gotcha. But um, yeah, that was that was the last time I was able to do anything, and then everything else was you know just iced and put on hold and you know postponed or canceled. And um, but my online store has been very busy, so I'm I'm. I am really, I'm pretty much wrapped up in bubble wrap most of the days. Gotcha. All right, so Tanya, where can we get the main birthday book? 
If you go to Malibu, Maine, and it's Malibu, like the city in California, but it's Maine, Maine, like the state.com. <laughs> there are links there and I am happy. I am shipping out like almost the day of every order to get books out to people. And then also just a reminder that The Home Road at thehomeroad.com, you can watch the movie for free in its entirety um, anytime. So um, people are interested in that film and haven't seen it. It's there waiting for you. Now, what suggestions, if any, would you have for someone like myself who is now stuck inside for the foreseeable future? Do you have any fun recommendations? Well, I will tell you yesterday, well, I mean, everything is so strange. I just got done disinfecting my beer and my snacks because I- <laughs> that's, that's essential, of course. Well, it's a new prerequisite for happy hour being happy is you need to disinfect your goodies. So, <laughs> so I mean, it, it is tricky because I was going to say, like, you should go walk circles around your apartment and just crank, like, 80s rock or something because that's what I do. <laughs> there you it's go. feeling really glum and crabby and weird. And um, I sort of put some heart on and it got me in a slightly better place. <laughs> so, <No>. absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I can be really more helpful. No, um, that's a terrific suggestion. I like that. <laughs> well, you know, I was thinking that um, I think one of the toughest t things about this is that um, we don't know where we are in the story. Right, and, absolutely. And I think that and certainly, I mean, we're starting to get used to the rhythm of our lives being disrupted and our traditions and rituals and things that we love. Um, that are we can't do right now and the people that we love and we can't love them the way we usually do sure. um, but I think the biggest thing for me is that we don't really know we don't know what the end looks like and that ambiguous sort of space that we're in is really challenging I do lean on history in times like these and not that we have we can't really compare this pandemic to, to ones in the past because this really is a global event um, but I'm trying to think about our ancestors and how courageous they were, and even thinking about my fourth great grandfather, who was a journalier and a day laborer. I mean, his life was uncertain every day, sure. pretty much of his life. You know, big family to take care of. And when you think of the courage that the people had that have come before us, I really find that to be comforting when I lean in on thinking about them. And I also like to think that we have big cheering sections somewhere where we can't know about them, but they're here and they're um, supporting us in some kind of spirit way. That is awesome. Well, thank you for joining us, Tanya. I appreciate it. Yeah, I know you guys have got a lot to do, and I, I really appreciate you doing this episode. It means a lot. Thank you. Cool. All right, joining us now is the guest we had from actually episode 24 of the podcast. He is a musician, and he is the man behind the awesome Memes Notebook Project, Robert Sylvain. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thanks for having me, Jesse. Great to now, be back. What has all this craziness done to your life and your performance schedule? Pretty much uh, brought it to a grinding halt, to say the least. Life goes on, however. In fact, stacked upon the usual. All of my kids are home from school. There you go. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> the, so you're stuck playing homes the, homeschool teacher? Is that what we're doing? Yes. Yeah, which I'm not really cut out for. <laughs> <laughs> but but we're having fun you know we're making the most of it so what 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 is the what has this done if anything to the to your memes notebook project so yeah the, the memes notebook project was almost completely done with recording when the virus uh pandemic hit the states and it became clear that we were going to have to shut down and put it on hold i had basically two uh, sessions, uh, two recording sessions booked uh, before mixing started. Um, and that was a, a fiddle player whose daughter is immunocompromised. And so he understandably uh, canceled. Um, sure. And the other thing was this really fun and exciting session that I had, uh, pl had been planning for months to have some of the sponsors, the early adopters and uh, fiscal backers from the Indiegogo uh, campaign to come into the studio and, and do a party track a la Marvel. Oh, cool. What's going on? That's awesome. 
Yeah, I was really excited for that. And there was uh, it, it was going to be on a chanson à répondre where uh, the gang would uh, all, you know, uh, repeat my sure. uh, my lyric. And it would be really the kind of the icing on the cherry on top, you know. But that sounds like a cool. blast. Because it, it was going to be dozens of people in the studio jammed sure. around the microphone. It just was not prudent so <laughs> no, I got I no, is, is there a place that's best for people to go to to kind of follow when the memes notebook might be might be ready to go now yeah yeah i'm so i'm, I'm uh, posting updates on my website which is robert sylvain.com the indiegogo site is on ice the the campaign ended uh but we're still taking pre-orders and you know i'm trying to uh keep uh, a little running blog of, of what's happening it may be interesting because uh especially with that uh, that gang vocal the party track uh might actually this might be an opportunity to bring some technology to bear into this uh project and we're looking at different ways to get people together virtually for for this gang vocal idea so it might be uh you know n not as planned but uh, something <laughs> really special Awesome. Well, that sounds like a ton of fun. Again, this is a tremendous project. We'll definitely be following. Thank you for joining us, Robert. Appreciate it, sir. Thank you, Jesse. And stay Good safe. luck to you. All right. Thanks. You too, sir. Bye-bye. Our guest, Daniel Boucher, is a name that will be very familiar to many of our listeners. Daniel is an insanely talented fiddler, and his performance at the Library of Congress has over half a million views on YouTube, which is insane. Now, he has been inducted into the American French Genealogical Society's French Canadian Hall of Fame. Daniel, welcome to the podcast. Bonjour, comment ça va? Now, where are you located? I am down in Bristol, Connecticut. And what does this crazy virus now look like in Bristol, Connecticut? If you don't go to the stores, it just looks like an ordinary day. You know, once you start going to the stores, then it's panic or chaos could set in when you look at the empty shelves, stuff you're used to getting. You have to change your mindset and get other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So what are you doing with yourself then to pass the time while this is all going on? Uh, plain and simple yard work, um, <laughs> you, you know, uh, but uh, just planning ahead. It's March, gardening season's around the corner, love gardening, so I got myself ready with a, a bunch of stuff coming from different locations for that, and then uh, the world of chickens is around the corner for me. I got to build my coop. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Now, I also happen to know that you do your own maple syrup. Now, yes. how, does the time, how does the timing of all this impact that process for you? Well, uh, this season we're actually done maple sugaring. Uh, we yeah. were done about uh, two, three weeks ago. We had a four-week season, which was super intense and our best ever. We made uh, twice as much as we did last year in half the time. Gotcha. That's awesome. Yeah. So now we've got plenty of maple syrup for the foreseeable future. Yeah, and we could uh, barter with people. And uh... <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like a good plan. I like that. Now, yeah. do you have suggestions for any of the rest of us? like myself, who are now stuck inside an apartment for the foreseeable future? Uh, go down your list of priorities you've been putting on uh, to the side. You know, uh, <laughs> neglecting, neglecting your house, neglecting your yard, and uh, now is the time to, to work on all that. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, I think it's pretty awesome that you have, I mean, your life can, can just kind of continue because you obviously you can still do your gardening, still do your outside work, hang out with your chickens. That's very cool. Yeah, work work has stopped because uh, nobody wants people at their houses. We do uh, sure. uh, residential remodeling, yeah, and sure. everything yeah, came to a standstill. And everybody is tightening on their tightening up their belts because it's all about uh, survival. If it's going to get that bad, sure. No, I, that makes sense. No, I got you there. Now, are you playing anywhere anytime? Was that it? No. Do you have anything that's affected that? In that respect? Uh, well, I, I haven't really been playing much. Uh, I did one concert with Jose, Va Jose Vachon last spring, and that was about it. And then now all my musician friends, everybody's at a complete standstill. Um, maybe the higher, uh, upper tier folk musicians up in Quebec, I'm sure they're doing a bunch of online stuff. Sure. Uh, maybe online jams. I've seen a couple online festivals uh, across the world. It's kind of cool. But uh, no, myself, it's just nothing much going on. 
You're not signing up for the online festivals, online shows? No, I, I've stepped back a little bit, but uh, um, I, I will get back into it. But uh, for right now, I got enough things to do. <laughs> you got enough going on. I, All right, well, I awesome. I appreciate, you, appreciate you joining us. Stay safe, sir. You too, Jesse. Now, our next guest appeared in episode 10 of the podcast. Jose Vachon is an incredibly accomplished musician, a member of the French-Canadian Hall of Fame. And her song, French in America, is the song that opens and closes every episode of the French-Canadian Legacy. Jose, thank you again for joining us. Oh, no, it's, uh, it's nice to see you and talk to you again. <laughs> <laughs> now, what does life look like for you now? Well, you know, I am self-employed, so I've kind of worked from home pretty much my whole career, uh, except for going to recording studios or, or performing. So in some ways, it hasn't changed too much. You know, of course, I've had to give up the three upcoming concerts that I was excited about. So luckily, they'll be just postponed. I mean, have you talked with venues in order to start that process? I'm curious from the venue side what their life looks like. Yeah, one venue I... You know, a week before, I kept thinking, they're going to cancel, they're going to cancel. But, you know, it wasn't it wasn't happening. And I just hinted that, you know, uh, things in Massachusetts were starting to really be <laughs> closing. And sure. suddenly they said, yeah, we, we just got the, the go-ahead from the state. You know, there's one of them was, actually, one was in New Hampshire, one was in Maine, and another one in, Mass yeah, another in Massachusetts. They're closing, but one of them already said, uh, here's the new date, but it's summer. I'm not sure summer will happen either. We don't know. Yeah, and that's the big thing. I would imagine if you are a musician who plans events well in advance, you get in order to publicize, make sure we get people there, uh, that would be tough if you have no idea when you're going to open up again. Exactly, exactly. And I had done a lot of publicity on my own to support some of these places, and, uh, well... <laughs> I guess we'll just do it again the next time. That's, that's all. Sure. And do you have any plans for what you're going to do with yourself since you're not going on these trips? Well, you know, there's this old French-Canadian saying <laughs> that, you know, it, this is March. And uh, I guess in English it's just spring cleaning, but we call it le grand ménage. <laughs> le grand ménage instinct seems to have kicked in. And I, I think the first week of, of uh, lockdown, I pretty much started attacking everything <laughs> it's drawers paper piles my desk has never looked so clean i mean it's just suddenly this this feeling of i need to accomplish something you know and uh, i've been doing i've been taking on projects that uh, i had put on hold because they just didn't seem appealing suddenly once you start something you get into it right and sure. so uh yeah no i'm, I'm feeling really productive in uh <laughs> in other ways maybe not in the music so right now so but i've been actually i shouldn't say that i one project that i had been putting off was learning how to digitize nice. all tapes and recordings and stuff and so i've been uh, transferring things and and finding clips and going oh this could be kind of fun to show you know how what i what i used to do in you know like concerts in northern maine or so on yeah i think i just came across one of your performances from like 1991 yeah. on Facebook. I don't know who had posted that, but I thought that was awesome. Me, uh, as I was uh, learning, I said, you know what, let me just try and see if I can. <laughs> Technology, you know, this is a time to be learning a lot of stuff that we tend to think we're afraid of. So, you know, you've got all these videos on YouTube that teach you how to do things. We have no excuse to not be learning continuously. No, I like that very much. I look forward to seeing all these new videos posted because I think that was neat to be able to see some of these performances. Very, very cool. Now, do you have any suggestions for someone like myself who might be stuck in the apartment for the foreseeable future? I feel for you. You were supposed to go to Quebec, right? To I was, yes. I was, I'm supposed to be there as we speak in yeah. a class. Oh, man, yeah. So, well, my son uh, is, you know, I know that the Franco-American Center of New Hampshire is going to be doing online French classes um, and my son also does Duolingo.com. Yeah, there you which, go. Uh, he says it's amazing for him. He may not speak, and that's where the immersion classes would, would be ideal for you. But he says, I've learned to at least uh, read nice. you know, 
various languages and I'm learning the grammar, I'm learning learning how to hear and understand, which is part of the difficulty. So once you understand people, then you get over your fear of speaking. <laughs> yes. and, uh, pick up an instrument that I've actually been, you know, yes, I pick up, I've, I've been playing the piano again. Nice. Uh, I had sort of, there was an instrument in the house that I, I, it was there only when I wanted to quickly learn, you know, a quick tune, but I never sat down and actually played all the old, you know, classical music and, so it's been fun to relearn that. And, uh, but again, my son had a ukulele, so he went on YouTube and he's teaching himself the instrument. That's awesome. <laughs> well, that's fun. Well, Jose, thank you very, very much for joining us. This is cool. Glad oh. we could connect. So, uh, hey, stay safe and healthy. That's all. Everybody just, uh, you know, let's hope that in a couple months. That I'm really trying to be optimistic. There you go. Yeah, well, hopefully you get those summer performances in, definitely. Exactly. Exactly. All right, take care. Thank you. Now our fathers look at us and sigh with despair To think that everything they love we simply do not share But the spirit never dies, our culture will survive Each of us must choose how much to keep alive Each of us must choose how much to keep alive Special thanks to Josie Vashon for providing the music. You can find more about her at josievashon.com. This podcast was produced and edited by Mike Campbell. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at fclpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at fclpodcast for more information about the topics discussed. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to this episode.